introduces to introduce Simon Lewis from the University of Sydney, where he's a professor in neurology and head of research centers and well-funded. And in my view, an example, and if you will, the gold benchmark, for at least in terms of quality of studies, for to study freezing of gait with MRI biomarkers, as well as EEG biomarkers. On top of that, he's also an old fashioned clinical neurologist who knows all the clinical assessments of the patients and has an interest that not only, not only is limited to Parkinson's disease, but also dementia with fluid bodies. So in terms of the clinical old fashioned neurologist, I share those values that Simon has. And I also appreciate Simon. I don't know, is it very late for you at the moment or very early? Very early. Yeah, so it's one of the two, but neither one is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you for this um, early wake up call. Um, um, but uh, I'm looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to start sharing my screen while I uh, set that up and just say thank you very much for the kind invitation. I think the um, the bottom line is that uh, it, it doesn't matter what time of the uh, the day it is. It's always lovely to be able to spend time with uh, with colleagues. As part of the setup, I'm just going to take the floating toolbar off so I won't be able to see things in the chat. So if anything goes wrong, just holler because I'll hear you. I'll have to let the audio on. Um, we have done the dry run, so hopefully people uh, are able to uh, see and hear things. There'll be a black box in the middle of the screen at the moment, which hopefully will disappear in a second. Uh, I can see it's just about gone. So hopefully that looks OK now. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to try and uh, tackle the subject of 21st century phrenology um, and the Parkinson brain. Um, and so um, this audience uh, is, <laughs> is very familiar with the concept of the Parkinson brain. And so I won't labor too many points there, but I will try and cover a broad swathe of uh, the, the, the portfolio that I've had a crack at over the years um, and hopefully keep it clinically relevant as well, as I'm not sure entirely uh, the makeup of our audience. So. Uh, I'll, I'll crack on. And I think, you know, one of the uh, the first things that we need to get our head around is my disclosures. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that um, uh, I'm funded, uh, thankfully, by the uh, NHMRC. Uh, I'll just hide that bar again. I don't quite know why that's reappeared. Um, I have no uh, relevant uh, conflicts um, uh, for this co uh, presentation. Um, there's a large body of work, and I'm apologizing in advance if I've underrepresented or misrepresented any of the findings, especially from colleagues uh, internationally. So uh, we are going to go at a fair old pace. Um, but I wanted to introduce this guy, uh, Franz Joseph Gall, uh, who, as you can see, uh, is no longer with us. But uh, this is the man who really led the charge for old phrenology, uh, which I think most of us will realize is now debunked. Um, but the concept of uh, various functions in the brain um, being allocated to different regions of the cortex and the idea being that if you had um, particular skills in an area whether it was knowledge or empathy or you know the ability to be pessimistic or aggressive and um, that part of the brain would be overdeveloped and because the skull hadn't ossified in childhood and um, the hypothesis here was that you could uh, I think the expression was read the bumps. And here you see uh, him in action, uh, you know, with the, one of these uh, uh, skull uh, representations. And, and they, they would make money out of feeling children's heads and telling parents that, you know, yes, your child is going to be very empathic and all of these things which are, are lovely. Um, I'll just hide that panel again. It seems to have popped back. Um, and, um, and so... There we go. They they created these sort of maps to tell you where, you know, sensitivity and empathy were. And, and obviously now this is pretty much debunked, although clearly, you know, we, we do now um, sort of recognize the idea that there are different parts of the brain that are doing different things. But I think we're much more into a, a networks model now. Um, and I think, you know, this <laughs> kind of concept is is probably a little bit too simple. Uh, and what we really rely on now is, is a bunch of techniques um, such as structural imaging, I don't know why that why that's, um, floating thing is still appearing. I'll just pop it maybe right up at the top and hopefully, um, there we go. Uh, and then, of course, functional uh, neuroimaging, uh, which we'll talk a very bit about. 
And then neurophysiological techniques like EEG, so surface EEG, um, and um, also recording directly from the brain with things like deep brain stimulation. Parkinson's disease, as I say, uh, you guys know uh, a, a, an amazing amount about and congratulations on the uh, on the award. I think it was back in 2021 to support your uh, Udall Center uh, for Parkinson's. Um, and so we know that it's a very common condition uh, which increases with age. And there's obviously this concern that there are going to be more cases over the next 20 years as we get an aging population. Um, characterized by its motor features, so classically regarded as a movement disorder with slowness, stiffness and shaking. Um, but as uh, your team have, uh, have led the way in many ways, uh, there are also these non-motor features of neuropsychiatric with um, cognition and psychosis mood and dysautonomia um, as, as examples and of course sleep disturbance and all the others that go in there. And this is a very typical uh, uh, advanced Parkinson patient with the shuffling balance disorder because they've got the walking right. frame and you can see the asymmetry with the tremor and the shuffling and the stoop and the hypomimia and this is you know very much if you like the physical end of Parkinson's disease and so I, mean, I guess slides I, are is could slides advancing I'm not sure that I'm seeing them advance oh I, I am advancing the slides so if you're not seeing them advance so this uh, are you currently seeing a post-mortem uh, of the no. brain stem no. Oh, oh, right. Let me restart or at least do something. I'll reshare. Okay. Oh, the screen sharing is paused. I see that. Okay. How do we, how do we do that? It's the Zoom problem. A, a Zoom problem. So let me yeah. stop sharing and then reshare. That might be the simplest way to fix the problem. Uh, bump and then bump and then. Here we go. Yep. Okay. I'm just mindful of the fact that I don't know. Is there a a large panel going across the screen at the moment? So we're seeing a substantia nigra at the moment. Yeah. yeah. And is it in is it in full display mode? I must confess. No. I'm... So we're seeing it in the um, you know in the view where you would still be working on the slides. Yeah. Understood. It's not in presenter um, view. No. And I kind of. Stop that sharing, and then let's see if we can share screen again. So when I'm sharing the screen, okay, okay, that looks like it might be working again, but you might be getting a large panel across the top of you some but um we're just there we go but that seems to be working so this looks okay rather than let me see if i can just hide those um yeah panel and then see if that'll be any better for us so hopefully that's advanced now to the non-dopaminergic pathology slide right mm -hmm. yeah so obviously serotonergic pathways involved not only just the dopamine noradrenergic cholinergic as well of course structural loss with cell death and the cortical lewy bodies that we see and I think what I'm going to try and focus on is is the fact that, of course, it's it's really um, the problem with Parkinson's is the rate that people end up in care. Um, you know, this is a disease that doesn't necessarily kill people. It's it's a life sentence rather than a death sentence. Um, but ending up in institutional care is what really frightens people. And and the major predictors are, of course, cognitive decline, uh, falls, and then psychosis. So. I'm going to um, frame my, the rest of my presentation around tackling these things. Unfortunately, of course, at the moment, we don't have any disease modifying treatment, although uh, there are major efforts internationally. And in fact, we're very lucky here in Australia. Uh, we have um, the Australian Parkinson's mission, which I'm the clinical lead for, uh, where we are um, already doing the first of uh, a series of disease modifying trials funded by the federal government. So. This is the, the aspiration is that maybe we can stop the disease progressing and stop these uh, care facility admissions. Um, in terms of cognition, uh, we know that it's a major problem and uh, Sydney kind of invented uh, dementia and Parkinson's disease with this, uh, the multi-centre study and uh, this very terrifying paper, which suggested that after 20 years of Parkinson's disease, the vast majority of our patients will end up demented. Um, it's a very striking feature. And we know that um, there are various risk factors, such as having cognitive impairment at the time you're diagnosed, uh, 
being older when you're diagnosed, sort of non-tremor dominant phenotype, higher UPDRS3 scores, um, and then things like a non-amnestic pattern or multiple domain MCI, all predictors of people going on uh, cognitively. But we know also that the uh, thin end of the wedge is that sort of executive dysfunction of visuospatial disturbance. And so some of my original work, this is back in Cambridge, had a look uh, really at whether we could identify the neural correlates of those uh, executive dysfunctions. And so um, we uh, we really focus in on working memory um, because uh, working memory is you know part of uh, disexecutive uh, problems, uh, which has got different components such as taking in information and maintaining it, and then retrieving it, and and also manipulating it. So they're all parts of our working memory. And so uh, I came up with a paradigm to dissect these processes, which essentially presented a series of four letters, um, and then there was a sort of maintenance phase. We have to remember those four letters. Uh, then a cue to tell you whether to leave the four letters in, in the same order or to manipulate them and change the order around um, and then ask you, you know, which of these uh, answers is correct given the cue that you've seen and then a response. And so this allowed us to do um, a nice event related study showing that when information was manipulated, um, you saw increased activity, bold signal uh, across uh, various uh, prefrontal um, and other areas. Um, and also, of course, down in, in the basal ganglia and the anterior striatum. And we saw those as, as significant differences um, uh, occurring within the paradigm and then compared patients with and without executive dysfunction that were otherwise matched on their cognitive ability and the rest of their disease and showed these frontostriatal disturbances uh, in those people with executive dysfunction. Now, of course, that's very pretty, but when you go to the support groups, what they really wanna know is, well, how do you fix the problem? Um, and so this is work done in Sydney, where uh, along with my colleague, Sharon Naismith there in the foreground with the stripy shirt, uh, we came up with a cognitive training program um, for our Parkinson patients, twice weekly doing brain exercises, uh, and published this in movement disorders to show that we could actually improve uh, memory, certainly in the short term, using this sort of approach. Uh, and I was quite flattered um, uh, a few years later to see work by Thilo van Eymann's uh, team in Cologne, uh, where they'd taken the same paradigm um, and actually done the same thing and done some cognitive training uh, in these patients with a disexecutive problem um, at over five weeks and, and randomized this in a control trial with um, patients who went into the intervention versus those that had a waitlist control and showed that actually cognitive training uh, was associated with the decreased activation uh, across that neural network as patients were practicing at home uh, that was associated with behavioral improvement. So here we see some uh, modern day phrenology where we can actually see the neural correlates uh, of something like cognitive training in Parkinson's disease. And they also showed there was decreased functional connectivity for things like maintenance and manipulation actually showed a reorganized functional connectivity. So the, the idea that we can actually probe uh, into uh, cognitive function um, using these uh, imaging techniques um, as a way of um, seeing what's going on and hopefully improving treatments. So I'm gonna move next uh, to the falls and the, and the freezing of gait. And this is um, the gait uh, back at my parents' place in, in Wales, where I originally came from. So uh, New South Wales is uh, one of those times when the sequel is much better than the original. So our weather never tends to look like this uh, here in Sydney. So we don't, we don't have the frozen gait uh, problem that I had back in, in Wales. But of course, clinically, this doesn't look like a gait. It looks a bit like this, where we've got a patient here with start hesitation, and he starts to tumble forwards. And here he comes off the stairs and gets a, a sticking to the ground problem as well. So this inability to walk despite the intention uh, so to do. And of course, I feel like I'm carrying coals to Newcastle here, um, given the experience and expertise <laughs> across at Udall uh, in this space. And in fact, uh, the Movement Disorders Society commissioned the Scientific uh, Interest Committee. Uh, and here you see first author Nico Bonin, um, basically uh, arguing the case that we need to get smarter about how we uh, understand gait disorders, freezing and balance um, in Parkinson's, taking more of a complex systems approach. And of course, one of the major contributions uh, from your group uh, relates to that uh, input from the cholinergic uh, system and, uh, and this nice work here in Annals uh, 
um, showing the changes uh, in the cholinergic system related to uh, falls and freezing of gait. And indeed, um, you'll be aware that there's an ongoing uh, randomized control trial, I think it's uh, phase three, uh, being led by Emily Henderson in Bristol, um, looking at the cholinesterase inhibitor rivastigmine to see if they can improve um, things like falls and freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease. So I think uh, you guys need to take a lot of credit uh, for the fact that here you are doing modern day phrenology, looking at the cholinergic system with neuroimaging, and then it gets translated into clinical practice or at least into a clinical trial that hopefully will help our patients. In terms of freezing, um, everyone uh, on this call will know that it's uh, got a major impact on, uh, on quality of life because of the lack of independence um, and is a common trigger for institutional care because of the falls. And it's common, um, and this uh, work just shows the prevalence uh, of freezing as, as the disease progresses. So as the, the herd and yard stage and that lack of independence and balance, you see that increasing proportion, um, almost ubiquitous, uh, that patients uh, will develop freezing of gait. So we're talking about paroxysmal episodes. Um, so most of the time patients can walk, but then there are these episodes when they can't. And it's, it's very common, as I said, and it tends to respond poorly to our current treatments. And interestingly, we know that there are a number of triggers, um, things like turning, um, dual tasking. So trying to do two things, you, you know, the analogy of you, you can't walk and chew gum. Um, and of course, the phenomenon of doorway freezing, where patients are, are passing through a doorway and stick or um, uh, common. Um, and then on the opposite side, the ability to relieve freezing with things like queuing, you know, whether that's auditory, like a metronome or visual sort of lines on the floor. So there are these um, uh, curiosities about the phenomenon itself, which probably tell us a bit about what's going on uh, with the pathophysiology that we need to understand more. So in terms of our models of what's going on, uh, we need to appreciate that there's uh, some physical uh, heterogeneity. So those patients with less in the way of tremor get more in the way of uh, freezing disease stage. So presumably this must be related to dopaminergic loss, but also uh, to that sort of cholinergic system going down that we you know, saw from Udal. Um, the influence of dopamine, because there is typically more freezing in the off state. And then these non-dopaminergic mechanisms um, and the non-motor associations, so things like anxiety or cognition and especially attention um, being associated with the phenomenon of freezing. And also, uh, it's worth bearing in mind that freezing phenomena don't, typically, uh, don't, don't only restrict themselves to gait. Um, so you know, people describe freezing of speech and freezing of hands. So these things have to be sort of taken into consideration as to whether they may all have the same shared pathophysiology. And this is a, a review um, article published now a few years ago um, by some of us reviewing uh, the clinical features, the imaging, neurophysiology, genetics. Um, if people wanted to um, take a look and, and, and see a little more about what's in there. Um, but I was going to spend a little bit of time talking about the, the model of freezing that I proposed now a few years ago, um, where really... Um, the, the, the suggestion was that there's sort of a decreased neural reserve across segregated circuits. So uh, circuits that uh, should be working in parallel, but sometimes intersect when you've got more demand on them. So this idea of crosstalk um, across these um, uh, circuits um, and leading to paroxysmal inhibition uh, of the output from the basal ganglia, which has uh, downstream effects on, on the output for the gate. And this sort of needs to take into consideration various neural structures so across from brainstem all the way up to the cortex. And also the consideration that you can reset the system. So once patients freeze, um, you can actually get them to unfreeze, often by getting them to focus on a single task, such as taking a step, lifting their foot and, and, and starting the circuit again. So the, the concept was really, um, you know, to think of the, the freezing as a, as a bit of a funnel where you get all these things coming into the system. So um, in a healthy um, uh, brain, it doesn't matter too much if you're dual tasking as well as you're walking, even if it's an anxiety rich situation, you can put all of these inputs through and you'll still walk normally. And that's even the case when you increase uh, the amount of stress uh, that's going on in the brain um, and, and you still get the normal walking because the system is intact. Whereas in a 
Parkinson brain, where one can think about striatal dopaminergic depletion being a bit of a, a bottleneck. Um, in actual fact, at the best, the walking isn't always perfect. And then when you overload the system, the idea being that you actually block uh, that funnel and get no output, which manifests as a freeze. And then after that, if you focus on just doing one thing, such as walking um, and to take away the other load, um, you can restart the walking, uh, with, even if it's a Parkinsonian shuffle. So sort of if we look at that in a schema of, of networks and, um, and circuits, um, you'll be familiar with uh, diagrams like this, you know, ranging from the, the cerebral cortex at the top to the central pattern generators down in the spinal cord and the basal ganglia structures and the brainstem and inputs from um, cerebellum. Um, and if we take our model and say, well, okay, on the left, we've got the healthy situation, but on the right, we've got this striatal dopaminergic depletion, uh, which means that there's less uh, inhibition, so an overactive uh, basal ganglia output structure in the GPI, the internal segment of the globus pallidus, uh, which means that we actually get um, uh, a shutdown across things like the thalamus going back up to the cortex, and therefore more input uh, coming down to structures like uh, uh, the subthalamic nucleus, and more inhibition to um, brainstem structures like the mesolocomotor region of the brainstem going down to the um, spinal cord, uh, manifesting as a, as a freezing episode. So then the question becomes, well, OK, well, how do we investigate that? And we've got a bit of a problem because most of our neuroimaging techniques, um, leaving uh, FNIRs aside for a moment, um, uh, require people to lie still in a scanner. Um, and so uh, one of the concepts that I hit upon a while ago now was the idea of perhaps using virtual reality to trick the brain with a sort of realistic environment presented in the first person um, with things that we could manipulate. So some visual or auditory feedback uh, mechanisms that we could probe various aspects of gait or at least model them, um, such as um, manipulating the environment um, and the, um, the cognitive load. So this is um, a little bit of a look at the virtual reality paradigm. So patients will see um, instructions on the screen like walk and stop, but also we can um, put in doorways that have different widths. Uh, all the time we're recording things in the background and we can also um, give cognitive loads. So training patients, perhaps if they see the word uh, blue written in blue that they keep walking, or if they see the word blue written in green, um, an incongruent crew that they should stop. And so this is sort of how it looks a little bit with the foot pedals working. And you can see here a, an arrest just as the patient uh, walks up to a doorway. So in actual fact, we um, we can record all of these uh, movements in real time with the uh, time lock to an MRI scanner. And also, as I'll show you, some of our other techniques in the operating theater. And here we go with a comparison, as it were, and uh, almost to spot the difference. So you can see that sticking and also that classic trembling in place that uh, clinicians describe where when the foot sticks, there seems to be a bit of a wobble um, going on at a certain frequency that uh, we also can see on the foot pedals uh, when patients have a freezing episode in this virtual reality environment. So one of the original studies that we did was to see whether um, a phenomenon uh, like uh, the virtual reality freezing, which of course isn't real gait, but models gait, um, does map onto uh, what we might regard as proper freezing and um, when patients performing a timed up and go task. And uh, we were um, pleased to see that actually there was a, a, a moderate correlation um, uh, between uh, the amount of real world freezing using things like timed up and go uh, to the freezing that we saw in the virtual reality environment, looking at the percentage of time spent frozen um, during a task when you should be moving. So uh, we're relatively confident we're mapping onto the phenomenon. We, we also had correlated it previously with, with uh, freezing of gate questionnaires. And this is the sort of setup that we use in the um, MRI scanner. So you can see at the top there a little screen um, presenting the data. And uh, in the uh, in the bottom of the panel there, you've got the um, the foot pedals. So um, patients are able to um, activate the task and, and look at it on that small screen. And a little thumbs up there so we can tell the ethics um, uh, board that actually these patients aren't too stressed out by the process. So this is um, some of the original work looking to see um, what the pattern of um, activation in the brain was um, associated with episodes of freezing. So this is uh, 
patients who um, described freezing of gait and we assessed outside of the scanner and, uh, and measured their freezing and then got them inside the scanner to do the virtual reality task um, and really uh, looked at the activity of freezing versus walking. So the idea that when people are taking normal steps, we can model what their normal walking uh, in, in uh, parentheses uh, looks like. Um, and then episodes where one would expect a step, um, but uh, the, the the stepping pattern is lost and there's this long latency and, and model that as episodes of onset of uh, the freeze and when they start walking again, the offset of the freeze. And when we looked at this and we were able to see that during freezing, um, these patients uh, exhibit increased bowl signal um, across uh, the, um, the, the prefrontal cortex, the bilateral um, posterior parietal cortices, insula, and the pre-supplementary motor area. And you can see the also the decreased bold in sensory motor cortex um, around the leg and foot region, and also in subcortical structures like chordate and the output nuclei of the basal ganglia, the um, subthalamic nucleus and GPI, and the uh, and also the mesolocomotor region, which actually um, the degree of decreased bold signal correlated with the percentage of freezing, not only in the scanner, but also in patients performing the timed up and go outside of the scanner. And when we uh, looked a little bit further, we wanted to see the effects of um, uh, cognitive load and, uh, and, and dopamine and, and able to compare uh, between freezers and non-freezers, the degree of functional connectivity. So moving away from circuits, but to neural networks. Um, so this is patients um, on and off medication and um, performing the virtual reality task with different levels of cognitive demand so that in the virtual reality they either see simple cues like walk and stop or more complex cues such as the word blue written in blue to keep going or the word blue written in green to stop um, so that sort of level of increased complexity and cognition and and really what we wanted to know was does the functional connectivity change um, during those states um, and is that different between freezers and non-freezers so we looked at various established networks, so motor network, the cognitive control networks, and then other regions like the basal ganglia networks, um, and perform an independent component analysis uh, across our freezers and non-freezers, and also looked at the effect of uh, medication and cognitive demand. So what we saw during successful walking was, was um, good connectivity between regions like the cognitive control network and the basal ganglia uh, network. But during freezing, um, there was a functional decoupling. So these, these regions um, in our freezers stopped talking to each other during episodes of freezing. And, and we could see that wrapped very nicely to just as they were coming up uh, to a freeze. And then actually they would reestablish their connectivity as they started to walk again. And here we see the effect of um, cognitive load. So in the non-freezers um, on the top uh, line there, you'll see it doesn't matter to them whether they're looking at simple cues or more complex cues. Um, they manage to continue to, if you like, talk across networks. Their functional connectivity is fine. And in the freezers, when the cognitive load is low, they also can keep these networks talking to each other. But as the cognitive load increased, that connectivity broke down. So real evidence here that we're seeing this sort of network change. And the effect of dopamine was interesting in that um, those freezers in their off state also showed reduced connectivity across these networks. So the role of dopamine um, being illustrated here. So what about the other gate triggers, uh, the freezing of gate triggers, such as turning and dual tasking doorways? And I haven't actually included the, the more recent slides of um, uh, our work of anxiety, where we've had patients walking across narrow planks in the virtual reality environment. Um, but we'll talk about it briefly. So here's turning. Um, so an episode of freezing as the patient turns. And then what's interesting when you turn is that actually, if you look at the patient's eyes, you'll see boom, 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 a series of saccades as they make a turn. And as they turn the opposite way, say, way you'll see the saccades bam, 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 the opposite direction. So we know that this is um, what happens with real walking. And what we then did was to develop as part of our virtual reality paradigm, we put some turns in. If you look at this guy's pupils, as they turn, boom, boom, boom. You see these little saccadic movements, even while the patient's just sitting down and navigating, and you can see uh, these saccadic movements. So again, we're pretty confident that we're modeling some of the um, uh, features that have real gait uh, in this virtual reality paradigm uh, with turning. Um, 
So um, this is a study uh, from Moran, who's now an assistant professor over in Leuven, um, modeling the uh, impact of turning and showing that even when patients weren't freezing, those freezers who are doing a turn have a different uh, pattern of activation compared to non-freezers. So there's reduced activity in the supplementary motor area, increased activity across the posterior parietal and inferior frontal regions. So again, we're able to probe what's going on. And um, the next um, uh, level of triggering freezing was dual tasking. So I've got a video of this patient who's walking along and we shout out a month of the year and he has to tell us the month before the month we shout out. So you'll see what happens to his feet when he does this. I'll keep quiet so you can hear the audio, I hope. November. September. Okay. October, very good. You can see as he um, hears the word November and has to think about it, this, the, we trigger a freeze. So in the um, virtual reality, we do this with the, um, the incongruent color paradigm. And this is work from Max Shine, some of the original stuff showing that, again, during this dual tasking, there's a difference in pattern. So even in the absence of freezing, when people are actually successfully performing this task, the freezers had a relative underactivation in regions like the anterior insula and ventral striatum, uh, which we know are implicated in the switching of attention, which we have seen on a cognitive battery is impacted in patients with freezing your gait. And here's some doorway freezing. So a patient walking up to the doorway and as they come to the doorway, their feet get stuck. So whether this is an attentional steel and they're having to try and work out the uh, the width and whether they'll fit through it safely, uh, hard to, to be sure. Um, but we also um, managed to map this with our virtual reality. And this is work from Eli Matar, um, who uh, demonstrated that during these um, episodes of walking up to a doorway, and again, not actually freezing, there was a selective hypoactivation in that bilateral pre-supplementary motor area in patients who are freezers versus those who are non-freezers. And I mentioned um, that we'd also done some more recent work with the anxiety provoking plank paradigm, which I don't have a video to show you, but effectively showing that when people are walking over narrow planks, as opposed to um, a normal corridor, um, there's increased anxiety and we saw increased freezing, which um, looked like it mapped onto a noradrenergic pathway. And we saw um, the uh, the correlation with pup uh, pupil dilation. So we're able to uh, to sort of implicate, if you like, a role for the noradrenergic, noradrenergic pathway. And indeed, um, this work from Kaylina Eggert martins who's now an assistant professor over in Waterloo in Canada, um, who was able to look at the pattern of uh, network connectivity in our freezers and, and tease out that there may be separable neural signatures um, correlating to sort of if you like um, motor phenotypes and anxiety phenotype type subtypes of freezing patients. So definitely um, it's not a homogenous phenomenon, this freezing. And so we need to delve a bit deeper. However, of course, there are limitations of neuroimaging. It's not real walking, there's no postural control in there. The temporal resolution of fMRI is relatively slow. So what we're uh, have done subsequently is to look at neurophysiology, so readings from ambulatory EEG and also direct cell recordings during deep brain stimulation surgery. So this is the sort of montage for uh, one of our ambulatory EEG phenomena, and you can see um, how um, patients are not encumbered by this. And I, um, uh, I guess what we were interested to see is in the literature um, that there are these, if you like, interactions between cortical and subcortical regions. Um, and generally, you get these different bands of power based on frequency. So, you know, the delta band ranging up to the, the beta bands. And what we've seen in the literature is that sort of beta activity is more akinetic or anti, uh, antikinetic, whereas gamma is more prokinetic. So patients who have more bradykinesia and less movement have got more of this beta activity. And we know that um, we see more of this in patients in their off state. Um, and then we, we give dopamine amelioration that uh, beta activity is reduced. So very broad terms with this sort of simple divide of what's going on to make you move or make you stop. So in terms of our work, I, I uh, do not pretend to understand any of this clever stuff from our engineers, this idea of feature extraction from the um, uh, neurophysiological um, uh, recordings. Um, but essentially there are a number of features that are taken out uh, with the analysis of 
um, things like power spectral density shows the strength of the energy as a function of frequency, centroid frequency and spectral entropy. Um, these are all terms that I wish I could understand in, in, in greater detail, but effectively neurophysiological biomarkers uh, of the signal that we're detecting. And we've published a, now a, a number of these papers, so identifying which uh, montages uh, are the best uh, for detecting uh, the EEG in patients who are getting freezing, um, predicting a freeze. So um, we've published papers now um, showing that um, five, up to five seconds and also up to two seconds before a freezing episode, there are changes in the EEG pattern um, that map to an episode of freezing and that these are actually different uh, to the pattern of EEG signaling that you see during voluntary stopping. So it looks as though ambulatory EEG might um, have a, way, a role for us into, into determining uh, the signal that predicts when patients are about to um, have an arrest in their movement. And of course, this might lend itself to um, some translation into clinical practice. And then uh, I wanted to take us into the more direct recording. So this is work from uh, Matthew Georgiadis, who's now uh, just starting his neurology training after doing his PhD. Um, which looked at um, patients during their DBS surgery and recorded uh, from microelectrodes in the STN when people were uh, having their, um, their DBS surgery and looked at multi-unit activity. So this is the intraoperative setup. So you'll see um, down at the bottom of our famous foot pedals and there's actually Moran Gillat holding the, um, the pedals in place there just to get them lined up. And then in front of the patient, uh, who of course is awake during the surgery, there's a display screen with a virtual reality environment on it. And um, of course, we're able to record from the brain uh, from these microelectrode recordings um, and try and align the signals with the events of interest. So normal walking, volitional stopping and freezing episodes and look at the firing rate uh, we're getting from that STN and then do a time frequency analysis of the signal to see whether the pattern uh, changes uh, with those, um, if you like, uh, clinical events. And then a, a Granger causality analysis to examine the temporal relationship between that activity and also uh, recordings from the lower limb EMG um, to see if there's a link between things like the trembling in place that we mentioned earlier and the pattern of firing in the brain. And this is a sort of uh, output of the raw data, but. What we um, performed in this was eight subjects who, as you know, most DBS patients are not big freezers, um, but we um, got eight subjects who actually had what we saw as a, a few episodes of virtual reality freezing um, and periods where they could walk pretty well and also periods where they were stopping voluntarily and uh, where we had good recordings to work from. And what we showed was that there was increased STN firing associated with the freeze versus periods of normal successful walking. And that those activity changes were dynamic. So the beta activity during freezing was greater than walking and it preceded the freeze and then peaked precisely with the freeze uh, onset. So when the feet stopped moving and then there was a, a, a burst of theta after that. And this interestingly um, was associated with increased um, EMG activity with a, with a frequency suggestive of what we've seen with the freeze index in people walking around in the clinic during timed uh, up and go um, paradigms. And this relationship um, between the beta firing pattern in the uh, subthalamic nucleus and this trembling in place in the EMG activity, suggesting there's a direct link between that firing and, and the trembling we're seeing in the lower limbs modeling, if you like, the real process of freezing. And this is what it looks like when you map it out uh, with that beta band coming in at the um, uh, onset of freezing, then the theta, um, presumably when trying to move the feet again, trying to re-stimulate the, the movement. Compared to voluntary stopping, of course, very important. Um, what you don't want to do is confuse all episodes as the same, but the beta activity of freezing was, was much higher um, compared to volitional stopping. So uh, we, we actually saw, and I'll just skip to the panel itself, that the amount of beta activity for a, if you like, a provoked freezing episode was much higher um, than you saw in, in the bottom panel here with, um, with, with voluntary stopping. So Although they're similar, they're obviously different, and hopefully that will allow us to tune into um, those patients who are having freezing as opposed to volitional stopping. Um, 
So I guess um, in terms of taking that work forward, what we're keen to do is to explore the role of ambulatory EEG and see if we can predict in real time who's about to have a freeze and maybe uh, link it to biofeedback. So if we could warn a patient that in two seconds time they're about to freeze, perhaps we could generate a cue, perhaps something auditory or visual beamed onto the floor and hopefully prevent them from having a freezing episode. And of course, um, with the advent now of uh, devices such as the Percept uh, DBA, DBA system for Medtronic, where you can record from the STN while stimulating patients after they've had their surgery, the idea that perhaps we could record these changes in beta activity um, that we saw from the operating theater and maybe have some on-demand changes. So if we saw a signal, perhaps two seconds before thought there was gonna be a freeze, we might be able to change the configuration of the DBS to maybe a low frequency stimulation for a few seconds and try and reduce the amount of actual freezing that patients have and hopefully reduce falls and, and, and keep people out of nursing homes. And of course, this would be a whole new indication for doing deep brain stimulation, which normally we avoid patients with freezing. Um, I'm going to move uh, from there uh, into psychosis, uh, particularly hallucinations. This is uh, my hallucinating patients and how they see me dressed up in the clinic. Um, and as we know, hallucinations uh, and psychosis uh, are the strongest predictor of ending up in a nursing home. And this sort of spectrum between well-formed visual hallucinations through things like eau de passage, eau de présence, um, and, and I don't really have time to go into those nuances today. But what we uh, have proposed in the past is the concept of, of an attentional network disorder underlying some of these phenomenology. And, um, and this may not lend itself just to Parkinson's, but also to other hallucinatory conditions. And this is a, a paper in, in progress in neurobiology that we put out a few years ago, talking through the various ways in which we could get to an attentional model, um, looking at things like neuromodulators, dopamine, acetylcholine, the serotonergic system, uh, the role of um, things like the superior colliculus and, and orientating the frontal eye fields, um, pathology in the retina leading to um, difficulties like uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome, the thalamic relay nuclei, very uh, much in vogue as a potential mechanism underlying uh, the role of uh, hallucinations, primary sensory cortex. So occipital pathology, we've, we've seen that across uh, other conditions like epilepsy where seizures arise or posterior cortical atrophy. And then um, uh, other roles such as the amygdala and, and of course, Patients with things like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder can also get um, phenomena, uh, visually hallucination phenomena. So these um, networks, the default mode network, the ventral attention network and dorsal attention network, um, we think play a critical role in this in terms of sorting out um, what might be going on. And this is a hypothesis paper that we put out a few years ago now reflecting the default mode network, which is essentially sort of the mind wandering part of your brain, and the ventral attention network is more for salience and um, orientating you to threat. And then the dorsal attention network in terms of, um, if you like, information processing to try and sort out ambiguity and tune you into the right outcome. And this is the analogy we made. Uh, in Australia, we're always scared of snakes and spiders. And the idea that if you're walking around and you see a coiled green thing in your garden, um, there's an ambiguous percept here in Australia, especially if you've got retinal pathology or something like that, which we see, of course, in Parkinson's and, of course, pathology across visuoparietal areas of the brain and the cortex. So ordinarily, the ventral attention network would tune you in and say, could that be a snake and protect you? And things like the default mode network would be in the background thinking, well, you know, do I remember seeing a hose in that garden? Do I, you know, remember that snakes live in Australia? But ideally, what would happen is that through the basal ganglia, the dorsal attention network would kick in and you would resolve this ambiguity and correctly perceive a hose. But of course, in Parkinson's, where that pathway is impaired, you may be left to your own devices where the dorsal attention network fails to kick in and you end up with a misperception this could be a snake. So we um, came up with a paradigm, the bistable percept paradigm, to try and trick the brain into it, it provoking misperceptions and assess you know, whether this could uh, then be mapped into brain activity. So the bistable percept uh, paradigm is an old concept. So you'll see this picture on the right, the sort of famous vase and two faces, a bistable percept. Could this be one image, both images? And we figured that patients with hallucinations may struggle um, with those bistable percepts compared to the monostable, but also might generate things out of monostable that isn't really there. So they could get this wrong in, in a variety of ways, either not perceiving the second image or perceiving things that just don't exist. 
And here's a nice example of one of our images. So in that uh, uh, photograph, you can see uh, in the background and amongst the trees, a second deer. Um, but our hallucinating patients, they might struggle and actually not see that, but also uh, might decide that there are actually these lurking characters in the background. And so here's a video of a patient. That looks like a nasty piece of work there of a figure of something to fear, something the to eyes fear. and the mouth. Eyes and mouth. He's, he's making and things the, up. these two look like animals of some sort. So those are animals things. of some sort. So seeing things that aren't really there and, and also this sort of perception of something evil, something nasty, which we often see with the Parkinson patients. And of course, there wasn't a second percept in that image. And this is uh, some of the original imaging work, which uh, looked at um, hallucinations and modeled those periods where people misperceived images and showed that actually um, there was this um, impairment uh, in activation across the dorsal attention network in patients when they were hallucinating. So in actual fact, uh, this supports that hypothesis of, uh, of, eventual, of the attentional network. So the inability to engage the dorsal attention network when patients were misperceiving in the task. And then within the hallucinators, what we wanted to see was, OK, what happens when they actually do misperceive? Is there any change in the functional connectivity across networks? So here we see um, that when patients were misperceiving, there was increased activity across ventral attention network and default mode network and reduced activity in the dorsal attention network and reduced visual network activity. And if you look at that in terms of the coupling, there's reduced functional coupling between the dorsal attention network and the default mode network and the ventral attention network. And interestingly, what we saw was increased coupling between the default mode network and the visual network. So the idea that you might have something in store where you say, well, I think I remember the snakes live in the uh, Australian gardens and then you're default mode network starts talking to the visual network and say, well, look, I can get you a snake. And they start imagining or seeing a, a perceiving a snake that isn't real. And we actually managed to correlate this um, so that that increased connectivity between the default mode network um, was, was correlated with the reduced connectivity uh, between the dorsal attention network and the visual network. So effectively, um, a failure to engage the dorsal attention network to resolve these ambiguities. So we're, um, we've done some neurophysiological studies um, with, with the, her, the BPP, the, the bistable percept, um, to, to see if we can model um, the effects. And we'd like to then take it into maybe future studies looking at pharmacological fMRI, perhaps with EEG or with imaging, um, to see whether there are any correlates uh, that we can uh, hopefully treat. And the final uh, thing I was going to throw into the mix um, is this concept of cognitive fluctuations. And cognitive fluctuations are a core feature in dementia Lewy bodies and common in Parkinson's disease dementia. And this is where patients zone out. So effectively, they have periods where they're lucid um, versus periods where they're more confused or unresponsive, um, despite being awake. Um, and this is um, often accompanied by disturbances in alertness and arousal. And this is um, a framework that we put uh, out a couple of years ago now, um, suggesting that perhaps these cognitive fluctuations that our patients with Lewy body dementias, DLB and PDD, um, might be have, have a problem with disordered switching between their brain states, this sort of continuum between sleep and attentive arousal, which would be distributed across neural substrates, ranging from brainstem nuclei right through to the cortex, and across different uh, neurotransmitter systems, noradrenergic, cholinergic, dopaminergic, for example. And the idea that we might be able to probe this with different uh, approaches, whether it's pupillometry looking at uh, attention, um, EEG states, um, fMRI, so that we can actually probe what's going on during these cognitive fluctuations. And this is work from Max Schein, who was my original PhD student, who did a lot of the freezing work and has now moved much more into this dynamic uh, um, functional MRI and raising the concept of segregation. So different parts of the brain that work as tight-knit communities and, and are involved in selective processes versus integration where disparate parts of the neural uh, uh, networks talk to each other rapidly, uh, which may be important for fast problem solving. And of course, what you really need is a balance between these mechanisms to work normally. And uh, here we see a model of, if you like, functional segregation and functional integration. And Mac uh, you know, proposes this balance between the cholinergic system, which might be um, pushing you more towards a segregated state, so you can focus your attention on doing some particular task versus a noradrenergic system through the locus ceruleus, um, uh, essentially allowing uh, more response gain for regions to um, 
uh, the disparate region of the brain to, to, to communicate quickly and resolve problems. And uh, this is interesting because, of course, uh, again, uh, Yudal had been leaders in this, and this is working in dementia with Lewy body patients, showing potential role of the cholinergic system across regions that you might be expecting. We talked about, you know, saliency and uh, alertness and visual attention uh, in the previous slides. And here we see the potential role of the cholinergic system, and of course, a large cholinergic uh, emphasis on things like hallucinations, but also potentially fluctuations. And so this final study I'm going to show you um, from uh, Eli Matar uh, looked at the DLB patients versus controls and showed that DLB patients um, had a less integrated brain network pattern. So they spent more of the time uh, in, during functional MRI in the resting state in a more segregated pattern. So this less switching into a more integrated pattern. And interestingly, this reduced integration was seen across areas that we you know, have identified dorsal and, and, and ventral attention networks and also visual and other uh, regions that may be important for resolving things like hallucinations. And this reduced network integration correlated with subjective measures. So um, questionnaires probing the amount of fluctuations that patients got outside of the scanner and also objective measures of fluctuations. So a thing called the sustained attention response test where, where patients have to uh, sustain their attention, actually their performance on that also correlated with the reduced integration that we were seeing. So less integration associated with uh, more problems of attention on that sustained attention task. And interestingly, when we looked across gene maps, um, specifically across noradrenergic and cholinergic receptors, we showed that those regions of reduced integration match the areas uh, of expression for specific classes of noradrenergic and cholinergic receptors. So tying in again nicely with the work from Udal. So there we have it. Um, so we've been really talking about um, paroxysmal symptoms that are common, especially in more advanced disease, which are difficult to probe uh, in the real world. But we've got things like neuroimaging and neurophysiology. And we're really appreciating this disseminated pathophysiology across neural networks. And I think our future studies have to combine these modalities and help us uh, to go forwards uh, with understanding it, because, of course, greater understanding will improve our management of these patients. So my final slide is just to remind me to thank my team uh, who do all the hard work. This is us back in 2017, the 200 year anniversary of the shaking uh, essay on the shaking palsy dressed in period costume at the, uh, the local Parkinson's charity walk. So with that, I'll pause, hopefully stop sharing my screen and, uh, and thank you for your kind attention. Okay. Awesome. Okay. That was a so sorry about the technical difficulties. Hopefully, it wasn't too bad. No, no, no. That was great. That was a great talk. Let me let me just ask a, a couple of questions. So, you're looking at saccades in one of your paradigms. Yeah. Did, did, did you quantify, or have you looked at any quantification of any saccadic abnormalities? Yeah, we did. So Courtney Walton um, a few years ago um, did this um, not in the scanner, but actually did saccades and anti saccades and managed to correlate um, the anti saccades. I think it was with the degree of uh, freezing and attentional deficits the patients had. And I think um, it's one of those situations where um, it's much harder to do in the scanner, as I'm sure you appreciate, mm -hmm. um, but it certainly would lend itself. And, and one of the other thoughts, of course, is to do the pupillometry in the scanner time locked at the moment. We're sort of mm -hmm. struggling and in inferring that, you know, if we do it in the, uh, in the, uh, in the setting of, um, uh, if you like, the virtual reality paradigm, time lock that pupillometry outside the scanner and then suggest that's what's going on. That, that's the best we've got, but you're right. If we could combine it together, it'd be good. Okay. Well, before Cindy asks her question, let me ask a, a technical question about, you mentioned using pupillometry. Has that been an issue? Because so many of our older patients have have had um, cataract surgery, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, is that is is that a, a problem in terms of recruiting subjects or in interpreting the data? Yeah, I think it is. Um, and we, we try to avoid it. And also, of course, medications. Yeah. Um, so, you know, by the time you're on a beta blocker and all of those other things mm -hmm. that can affect, you know, your dopaminergic, your, your neurogenergic responses. Yes, we, we try and avoid it. But it does then lead to a very skewed population. Yeah. Cindy, your turn. Thanks very much. Really great talk. Um, hard to decide which one I want to go for first, but I guess. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. It's yeah, no, 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 it's good. There's a lot of really cool stuff. So I guess um, let me ask a relatively simple one. So relating back to you know some of the dorsal versus um, 
ventral shifts that you saw in the hallucinations. I was actually wondering, so do you, have you looked at that at all in the um, freezing studies where you're scanning them? Because I could also see potentially, you know, sort of breakdowns in that connectivity and then maybe sort of bringing the dorsal system back online when you recover from the freeze. Yeah, and it's interesting because when we did the, the network analyses in the freezing, I guess we were less tuned into looking at things from the um, the optic of the ventral attention network and, and, and looked at things like the cognitive control network and how it spoke mm -hmm. to the to the basal ganglia networks. And I, you know, as the guy that sort of originally reported the attentional deficits on cognitive testing that you see with freezing and correlate with severity of freezing, you're absolutely right. <laughs> it should be there. Um, but we've never gone back to to reanalyzing it. And I think you're right. I mean, reductionism here and Occam's razor would say, well, probably the brain hasn't got that many different ways of doing this. And actually there's right. a, you know, a common pathway. But I think it's, you know, partly the way that we do science where the field says it, you know, we, we, we look at it from this perspective. And it's funny because if I take it in the very simplest terms, for me, freezing of gait, when I first started thinking about it and writing hypotheses was a circuitopathy. And now, of course, it's a networkopathy. And I think that's what we're seeing increasingly is that we're all having to shift as our imaging and, 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 and uh, neurophysiological techniques get better or more refined. We actually have that ability to say, hang on, it's not as simple as, you know, the big bones connected to the small bone connected to the little bit of the brain. It, you know, it's not one of those things that just uh, quad error demonstrandum, this thing affects that thing. It's, it's a much wider network, which is why it's so bloody complicated for us to unravel, especially in the clinic you know right and, and we try and we try and purify it for the for the research setting and it's terrible you know, <laughs> we get this we, we 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 get this distorted you know just as, as you know professor alvin is saying there you know you sort of say well well is, is this the real world though because i've got patients with cataracts and beta blockers and you know they still right. have these problems so, yeah probably but you know as soon as we try to publish it people say oh what about and you go okay yeah no yeah. well sometimes you have to say good enough for government work um but yeah, so the, the a related question, and I, you know, I suspect it's going to be a similar answer. This is just hard. Um, most of the work that I have seen taking a look at the dual tasking mm -hmm. manipulations, which I think are really interesting, it's been sort of a zero one kind of a situation. Um, and I often wonder if in the context of especially trying to understand overactivation, underactivation relative con to controls as, a, as compensation versus um, dysfunction. So like in working memory, we can, it's a lot easier for us to manipulate load. And I'm wondering, like, have people tried to take a look at things parametrically to see if you could actually get a curve out of it? So the, the, we actually have the sort of ability to do that because with the virtual reality paradigm you can give a doorway at the same time as a cognitive cue at the same time as walking over a mm -hmm. plank um, and overload the system the problem is when you send it to the reviewers they say well which is which and you right. say yes it's it's that's what happens in the real world too you know monkeys swing from branch to branch looking for things to eat and not get eaten they don't you know do one thing at a time and this is this is our problem but it, it turns out that, of course, you have limited power when you when you combine all of the events and then the reviewers just get, you know, increasing. So we've we've always struggled with trying to separate events so that you don't have two things that might concatenate. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the real world will tell us just do it the other way. Um, and then the reviewers say, well, how do you know which is which? Mr. Yeah. Hart. OK. OK. Enrico, I think you had a question. Yes, so actually, it's again uh, regarding networks and uh, like, like for the talk. Uh, so, uh, specifically, uh, you mentioned briefly regarding the different stimulation, uh, especially because of the interactive recordings, and that it's not typically uh, used. But there are a few groups that actually are interested into applying deeper stimulation uh, in different targets. Um, but from what I actually see from from uh, also presentation that what you're arguing is that maybe a multi-target uh, kind of approach that will be more beneficial, especially uh, for Trisio Gate. For example, uh, there is a group in Turkey that try also to have a dual target as well, like in GPI and SDN. Um, so basically my question is, do you think it's worth more to spend actually effort in dual target or multiple targets for stimulation in the case of Trisio Gate, or you think that 
the classic, in a sense, uh, single target approach with caveats could be still successful for this case? Yeah, so I think that it's also the art of the possible. So, um, I mean, clinically, we don't tend to select DBS patients on their freezing. So we don't have well-constructed trials that say, would a dual target be better than a single target? Because we don't select patients for their freezing, we select them for their wearing off. So that's that's the first challenge. Where the, where the virtual reality allows us to play a bit is that in the operating theater, you actually have the scope to probe both systems at the same time without committing a patient to that outcome. Right. So in actual fact, the way that I would argue this is that you, you know, would probably structure it to do a small trial in a discreetly selected number of patients whose major problem is freezing, and you probe those networks and listen in to multiple areas at the same time, if you can technically, and it's quite hard to get, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a bus ride uh, between all of those areas that we can stimulate. Um, and of course, I, I think um, the ethics on trying to do that get harder but well, in actual fact, I think that is the better way of doing it rather than trying to do a clinical trial where you have to get, you know, six patients with this, six patients with that, change the stimulation and, and, and measure it. I think before you go to that level, you could do it in a very small number of patients doing the recordings, using the virtual reality and, and seeing whether there are potential advantages of having more than one site. Yeah, that's a pretty good point. So for... Um... For disclaimer, actually, I was part of the uh, of the UF group that was working on the close up stimulation for Prisio Gate. So at that time, we actually had implanted both PPN and GPI, uh, and, but probably there was a little uh, a lot more than what it could do in a sense, uh, and because there were many many different aspects. Um, but yeah, so I definitely agree with your point as well. Uh, I think this is interesting uh, way to go about it. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, Nico. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. You very elegantly um, referred to the intertwining of dopamine, norepinephrine, and still choline. And based on your recent work with Kalina, um, you, you nicely show that based on measurements of pupils during freezing of gait, that there is actually no adrenergic component to freezing of gait that appears to be at least mediated by anxiety, which is a well-known trigger um, um, of, um, um, of freezing of gait. How do you en envision the noradrenergic system, um, uh, although it, we have to recognize that this is a multidimensional problem and multi-circuits like you alluded to, um, uh, for its number one cognitive role, and number two is the fact that neuromelanin MRI of the locus ceruleus in Parkinson's is a very early phenomenon, while um, um, freezing of gait is a relatively state, late stage disease. Yeah, look, I think um, just to say the last part first, um, I think that if the locus ceruleus neurogenergic system um, was the only thing in freezing, um, you're absolutely right. But I think what we see is, is neural reserve. And it, it's not about the amount of neurogenergic uh, cells that you have surviving. It's the amount of firing that they not only have, but the influence they affect on, on the network. And this is that concept of integration. So you, you, don't, it's, it's a, you, know, it's, it's, you don't have to stimulate all of the brain at a certain level. You need to stimulate certain nodes that then have a much more uh, rapid integrated function. So I don't think it's an all or none, but I think that as an intermittent fault, the question is whether there are periods where you overload that uh, potential to, um, if you like, raise the gain on, uh, on neurogenetic arousal mechanisms. Um, as for how I see it progressing, interestingly, um, you'll probably be aware, probably, probably on the papers, you're probably on the advisory panel, that there are neurogenergic um, uh, trials, um, so agents being looked at uh, to impact on cognition in Parkinson's disease. And my understanding is that the phase two hasn't yet been uh, published from the CLIN11 trial, but my understanding is that they're keen to, to move that forward, looking at an agent such as clenbuterol. So essentially the idea of targeting, if you like, arousal through neurogenetic pathways that might be beneficial 
not only for cognition, but also for gait, but also for potentially fluctuations and, and so, so sorry, Simon, there was Simon, Simon, there was an there was a zoom. So I'm not sure whether the zoom pause was me or Nico looking at Nico having dropped off. Did, did everyone hear that I was sort of saying that, you know, we are using, there are clinical trials now with the noradrenergic pathway. So I think it might've been Nico, yeah. Um, so I think it's, and, and you know, as a simple clinician, being able to just go, here's your drug that will improve not only your cognition, your gait, your hallucinations, your fluctuations, that'd be fantastic. Do I think that's likely? Oh gosh, I'd really love to, but I don't, don't think it is going to be as simple as that. Sorry, Nico, I think you dropped out. But everyone else apparently heard my answer, so that's probably on your end. And you're now muted, I'm sorry. Yeah, there was a Zoom uh, freezing, so, um, but you were referring to the Droxydopa trials, which for which indication oh. freezing of gait is approved in, in Japan, but not elsewhere. But I maybe I've missed, did you also mention other clinical trials, maybe like atomoxidase? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, yeah, and atomoxidase is kind of in there. Uh, the one I was mentioning was clenbuterol. And so the phase two isn't uh, out there, but you'll see on uh, on the, the clinicaltrials.gov network, um, I think it's a phase two study. I think it's called CLIN01111, as it were. So looking at the effect of clenbuterol um, combined with nadolol as a peripheral beta blocker, um, so you don't uh, uh, overblock these patients or overstimulate these patients um, as a way of targeting cognition. Um, and, and executive function in particular and, and attention. Okay, thank you. Roger, you're muted. Sorry, Roger. Um, I think Professor Lewis has been very generous today, taking his time from a holiday. So really thank him for an excellent talk. Um, and I think we're gonna stop there. So look, Simon, thank you very much. That really was a lot of fun, actually. So, Good. Well, like I, I I really appreciate the opportunity, and I hope that as this COVID thing gets better, uh, yeah. we'll have the opportunity to meet up more in person, and uh, I'm really grateful for the input as well. So thank you so much for your time and energy, and, and please stay safe. All right. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Much appreciated. Yeah. Bye. All right. I think